Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's Protocol Labs Research Seminar Series. Today, we are joined by Supra Mazumadar, who will be presenting her work titled Crypto Maze, Privacy Preserving Splitting of Off-Chain Payments. Supra is currently pursuing her PhD at the Indian Statistical Institute, where her research interests include scalability and privacy in blockchains, data privacy, and combinatorial optimization. Thank you so much for joining us today, and I'm going to let you take it over from here. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining the talk. Uh, so I will be presenting. So this is one of my work, which I've done as a part of my PhD thesis. So my thesis de deals with uh, designing secure off-chain protocols for payment channel networks. So specifically, I'm interested in studying the scalability issue in blockchain. So this is a joint work with uh, my supervisor, Dr. Shushmita Ruj, who is presently a faculty at uh, UNSW Sydney. So let me, uh, so the title, I would say crypto may, so uh, I mean, you can consider that we have a, given this network, I mean, since I'm, I have, my work deals with payment channel networks, so that's what's in sync, uh, being in sync with the, the work which I've done, so this is the title, so we have done some uh, good construction so as to ensure that the privacy is preserved at the same time it's quite efficient not hindering the scalability and at the same time we have ensured that whatever state of the art protocols we had studied it's uh, trying to counter the shortcomings of those so like if i need to sum up within one minute what exactly the work is trying to address so in payment channel networks, we can have quite high value payments. So it's quite unlikely you get a single path for routing the uh, such high value payment. So you have to split it across multiple paths. So our basic idea is to ensure that it's atomic. That means either uh, whatever partial payments are getting routed, either everyone is, uh, all the payments are re reaching the recipient or none of it is reaching. At the same time, it should be privacy preserving the sense, sense that none of the intermediaries must figure out who is actually involved in routing this payment. And at the same time, since uh, only the sender and receiver has the motive of doing a transaction, intermediate parties are just interested in uh, earning some processing fee and just not going into the fact that they can be altruistic and uh, they might be interested in just running the protocol, but at the same, but I'm just assuming that they they will route a payment if, given they get a good processing fee. So in the process, in none of the intermediate parties mustn't lose coins. And at the same time, since the payment is being split across multiple parts, they should be unlinkable. Like even if some of the nodes collude, they shouldn't figure out whether they are part of the same, they are routing the same payment or they are actually routing different instances. And at the same time, uh, we figured out that when you're splitting payment, there might be some set of channels which might be shared across partial payments. So our objective is that uh, since you are routing a single instance, so even if a channel is shared, you are instantiating just one single off-chain contract for that. So this is the key idea which I will try to address in the talk. So, uh, let us just see like why we are interested in studying this scalability of blockchain. So as you can see, like on uh, this, um, some of the popular cryptocurrencies is still yet to match the, the level of throughput which uh, this conventional payment system offers. Like as you can see, Visa, it has got uh, around 24,000 transactions per second processing speed and PayPal also is quite hard. Recently, Ripple, I'm not sure, but I have uh, seen somewhere that it has uh, crossed Visa and it's now around 50,000. And there's uh, a news which stated that Ripple processed around 50,000 transactions per second. So, but yet uh, Ethereum and Bitcoin, I mean, Ethereum definitely, if it is upgraded to the Ethereum 2.0, it will uh, move into the proof of stake uh, mechanism. So it's enhancing scalability and, uh, Finally, this Bitcoin still it's yet to catch up with such conventional payment systems. This is uh, what is the problem which is actually faced in uh, such uh, decentralized uh, uh, payment net, uh, so cryptocurrencies. So 
uh, this is a term which actually this concept uh, comes from the cap theorem, which is used for decentralized data storage. So this uh, scalability trilemma, uh, the flavor is the same, the, coin, um, the term coined by Vitalik. So what does it state? Like, uh, I mean, uh, you can either have like security decentralized, you can have a combination of either two, but not the three of the properties in a particular decentralized network. Uh, so like if I say this currently a Bitcoin and Ethereum, they are decentralized and secure, but since uh, uh, they use a, a civil resistant mechanism, like uh, Bitcoin is using proof of work and that involves a lot of computation overhead. So scalability is a major bottleneck for such uh, cryptocurrencies. Next, what can be the thing? So, uh, I mean, decentralized and it's scalable. So like IOTA, VeChains, but uh, they, they, they are lacking on the security side. And there, there's uh, certainly laps like there can be uh, a prominent leakage of sensitive information and attacks on these systems. Uh, next is like uh, we can have scalable and secure system but like Ripple, Hyperledger and Stellar, but to some extent they are like permissioned or like some consortium of uh, organization are controlling this particular network. So again, it's not fully decentralized. So we can say that if we are using a public blockchain, then the more decentralized it is, the more uh, secure it will be like more resilient to civil attacks. But then again, if you want a certain amount of centralization, then definitely there is some person who is controlling the security aspect as well. Uh, like what are the solutions which can address this scalability trilemma? So I will just speak about layer two protocols, but uh, I mean, there even in the base protocol, I mean, in the layer one as well, there have been several works like sharding, uh, alternate consensus protocols, which uh, currently the, a lot of work is going on, which is which will ensure that definitely uh, these uh, uh, pay this this Bitcoin and Ethereum they scale up and match to the level of uh, provide a high throughput. But under uh, like uh, why we are particularly why am I I am particularly interested in layer two protocols is that it's quite modular. Also one doesn't need to do a hard fork in the um, underlying uh, blockchain. And at the same time, uh, we can just get the scalability without worrying too much about the security because you can always fall back on the underlying blockchain network. So here are some of the instances like Lightning Network, Plasma, Rydal. There are other examples of uh, as well like side chains and rollups, uh, plethora of examples which are currently existing. So I will discuss about just payment channels. Uh, so the here, like what is the basic concept? I mean, uh, given we have the underlying blockchain, like how one can construct a payment channel and basically how, it, uh, how a network can evolve out given we have certain set of payment channel. So basically you can think of it as like a concept of two parties having a, a joint bank account so consider here it's like uh, uh, alice and bob uh, they deposit uh, of around i mean it's imbalanced but uh, alice is depositing says 0 0.01 btc and bob is amount is quite less than that and they mutually agree exchange signatures and that transaction is getting recorded on the blockchain and this uh, instantiates the creation of payment uh, channel so I'm not going into the details of like uh, how this can be done because that uh, you can refer to the paper by Poon and Raya. And next once this transaction is funding transaction is getting recorded on chain. So these two parties can happily do several off chain transaction. Like suppose uh, there are 10 such uh, transactions in which Alice needs to transfer around uh, 10 to bar so minus six BTCs to Bob, uh, maybe for in lieu of certain services, like maybe he wants to buy, uh, maybe for internet service, or maybe uh, maybe he's pre taking, he's printing out documents and Alice is providing the service. So in that case, I mean, uh, uh, like if each of these transactions hit the blockchain, then it, it would be quite time consuming because what Bob demands is like instant payment and instant service. 
So in that case, uh, it's better they just mutually keep track of whatever state update it's going on. In case of the, there is a dispute, then obviously uh, what happens is that whenever you update your state to the next state, then you have to revoke it. Like they will share the keys for the prior transaction and update the state. So in case one of the participant is acting malicious, then the other party can slash the funds deposited in the funding transaction and penalize the counterparty. Uh, as of now, I'm not going into like what can happen if either party is acting malicious. So consider like after 10 transactions, they decide to close the channel. So they uh, mutually, my, they might agree to uh, uh, on a commitment transaction, which states out the balance, like what Alice is entitled to and what Bob is entitled to. And finally, this transaction hits the blockchain. So over here, you can see like instead of 12 transaction hitting the blockchain, we we are just happy with two. So as uh, 10 transactions, there is no record as such. Like whatever happens is happening with mutual consent. So next, like let us see. So this is the paper where you will get an idea like how this Bitcoin Lightning Network and how or what is the underlying concept. So let us see how things work in the ch ch payment channel network. So consider this Alice, it has opened a channel with Bob. Bob has opened a channel with Charlie. So now uh, if Alice wants to do a transaction with Charlie, so what it can, what she can do, she can open a fresh uh, channel with Charlie and, uh, sorry, so she can open a fresh channel with Charlie, but uh, already she has a channel with Bob and Bob is having a channel with Charlie. So opening another channel might be a costly affair because you have, an, have to hit the blockchain and provide the uh, mining cost for the particular transaction. So instead of that, what they will do, they can leverage on this existing channels, like Alice transfers payment to Bob, Bob transfers the payment to Charlie. So in the similar fashion, there can be other participants which can uh, form channels which, uh, with these members in the network. And together, they, this can be like a graph network uh, with bi-directional channels. And they can happily transact. Uh, and in case of any dispute, they just go and settle it in the blockchain. So let us see, like, as I was speaking, like what will be the problem with high value payment routing? So suppose there is a request where uh, this node A wants to transfer seven units to node H, but as you can see, there is not a single path which can accommodate this uh, transaction of seven units. So the, instead of uh, like rigorously uh, adhering to finding a single path, it's better the payment is split and uh, send as partial payments across the channel. So like we can do a split of four and three. So once you send an amount of four units to channel AB, so B pushes it to E and again D will push three units to C. So in this way we can uh, complete the fl flow and get the, uh, and transfer this payment to uh, the node H. So I'm not going into like how you can do this routing. So any standard uh, maximum flow algorithm or push tree level or so, um, there are many al routing uh, protocols stated in literature. So uh, for multi-path payments, so any of them might fit here. So uh, let us now assume that we have this set of loops. So now we see like how payment uh, occurs in Lightning Network uh, particularly. So uh, suppose X wants to transfer some amount to W. So she figures out that there is a path from uh, X to W via this intermediaries Y and Z. So what W does is that uh, he samples a random value X and sends the hash of the value to H, uh, to X. Uh, so this H is the hash which is, uh, which is shared with X. So what he does is that he forms an uh, hash time lock contract. So the name comes from the fact that uh, hash is the puzzle that the counterparty needs to provide the pre-image in order to claim this amount. And so uh, over here, like uh, I have assumed that it wants to transfer four units to W. So like and each intermediary is charging 0.1 units. So that's why uh, X is transferring 4.2 units to Y. 
why it claims 0.1 units and transferring 0.1, uh, Z is uh, claiming a fee of 0.1 and finally four units is reaching W. And the timeout, since it's, uh, we are terming it as time lock, so each off-chain contract has a time lock. So the, it's in uh, decreasing order, like T1 is strictly greater than T2 and T2 is strictly greater than T3. So based on the certain system parameters, so we choose this timeout period within which these parties need to re react and solve the payment. As the other party, like suppose uh, Y is not responding within time T1, X will go on chain and the state will revert to the uh, initial state when uh, 4.2 units will be credited to X's account. So this is how a uh, hash time lock contract, but it holds good for single path routing. Now let us see like whether we can extend this for a multi-path routing. So consider like we assume here, like suppose uh, this party B and C, they have colluded and they are talking to each other. So they know what is happening. So suppose now A is forming an HTLC with B and D A has formed an HTLC with D. Now D has formed an HTLC with C and uh, but uh, C, uh, C realizes the terms of the contract like uh, that is the uh, uh, hash used is same as what uh, B has received from A. So that means, uh, but this, this is, there's a time lag. So like before C has received this, B has received. So at that time C wasn't aware like whether they are receiving the same time lock, uh, hash value. So B has forwarded to E, but then C realizes that this is uh, this is the same hash value which uh, she is receiving. So what happens that she will not uh, forward it to the party F. So why this is a problem because I mean, we, it's a tendency of the nodes in the network that they would prefer to route a full valued payment rather than partial payments because partial payment is subjected to the success of uh, all the partial pay payments in other routes, right? Like uh, we will see like B and C if they also that this is a partial payment. So they know like if B's path succeeds, but C uh, somehow somewhere in if C routes the payment and fails at path uh, at node F then the entire uh, uh, transaction, I mean, the state of the channel will be reverted. So this is a big problem. Like they will be lock, uh, locking their collateral for a certain amount of time. So instead of that, we, or say this party C, they would prefer to lock their collateral if it's a single valued payment instead of partial payments. So that's why like uh, uh, C has dropped this payment, but since E, e uh, this payment has reached E, so E has forwarded to H. Now, H, as you can see, instead of receiving seven units, it receives just four units. So the problem is that payments become linkable. And uh, at the same time, you see that payment is not atomic. So just partial payment is being successfully routed. Uh, so now what can be done? So there's already, already a work done to address this. So this is termed as atomic multipath payment whereby for uh, what uh, it can be done is that you we uh, the sender A figures out that there are three paths which will be routing the payment to uh, participant H. So one is uh, so one is the path marked in yellow, the second in green, and the third part is marked in blue. The, what is the underlying idea in atomic multipart payment? It's that uh, once the uh, con off-chain contracts uh, reaches and all the partial payment is received by H, it will receive this uh, partial secrets like SH, from the uh, first path, SX from the second path, and uh, SD from the third path. So once it does a ZOR, it will receive the master secret. And using this master secret, it can figure out what is the actual pre-image for this hash H, hash X, uh, hash value X, and hash value Z. So once it gets the master secret, it can uh, reconstruct the pre-image for each of this path and claim the payment. But there are certain problems like you can see these three channels, there are uh, uh, two such contracts. I mean, redundant contracts being established for each of the parts because these channels are shared across this uh, partial, uh, parts which are routing the partial payment. So the, definitely that's an overhead. And next is a big problem like the, 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 this is a problem faced in HTLC. So the, uh, this attack has, was identified in one of the paper uh, anonymous multi-hop lock. 
So what happens in this attack is that suppose Alice wants to do a payment to Bob and in, in between you can see these two tiny devils are existing. I mean, they are uh, participants which is routing the payment. So what Bob does is sharing the hash value. And in the meantime, Alice just proceeds with her HTLC. So what Bob will do is that Bob will share the pre-image with the devil X. But the, the devil, instead of uh, sh sharing the pre-image with Charlie uh, and uh, Charlie sharing it with Kitty, so, so instant devil will just suppress the secret and directly do an off-chain communication with the another devil with whom he has co colluded. So this devil directly shares the pre-image with Alice. So now you can see like instead of a path length of five, it is becoming a net path length of two because this intermediary channels like with Charlie and Kitty is being circumvented. So what is the problem now? So what devil will do? Devil will cancel the uh, off-chain contract with Charlie. Charlie will in, uh, in turn cancel it with Kitty. Kitty cancels the off-chain contract with devil. So they, this intermediate parties like Charlie and Kitty will think that the payment has failed, but in reality, the payment has succeeded because Bob has successfully managed to transfer the secret uh, to Alice. So what devil is the managing to do? It steals fee of Kitty and Charlie. Who is the loser is that actually Alice? Because Alice thinks this path is of length five and she is pay paying actually four intermediaries. Was actually these two intermediaries. I mean, two actually means one. I mean, you can consider this as a civil. So this one party who is capturing all the uh, fee for uh, rest of the intermediate parties. So basically, she ends up paying extra. So there is another construction by uh, Sanchez, Carte, and Maffei on uh, ma this construction. Actually, there uh, was. Uh, this wasn't mentioned in the paper, but actually it prevents, helps in preventing wormhole attack. So as you can see, like in each of the auction uh, contracts between Alice, Bob, Charlie, and Eve. So they're using some different condition like Y1, Y2, Y3, and Y4. And so Y4 can be solved using X4, Y3 can be solved. So internally, these parties receive certain partial secrets. So once, Eve receives the secret X4, she can reconstruct the pre secret value for Y3, condition Y3. So she will just do a ZOR of X3 with X4 and share it with Charlie. Charlie does the same with Bob. So now you can see like even if Bob and Eve colludes, they cannot figure out where they, they are part of the same payment. And uh, like, even though they, they can figure out, but they cannot, they cannot figure out what is the pre-image because uh, the condition Y4 and Y2, it's different. So in, if they can solve it, that means they are able to figure out a collision for this particular hash. But still the problem of redundancy persists, like as I had shown it previously, uh, sorry. Uh, so like even if you, uh, and this protocol is for single path, so we do not know like this extension would not be straightforward. So it would involve again certain amount of computation. Next, uh, we uh, this is the paper which uh, is quite interesting. Like deals with uh, uh, split dynamic splitting of payments. Like instead of figuring out the routing and then going for protocol, it will just uh, put on the condition as and when the payments are being split. So, good point about this protocol is that this uh, uh, the sender can just uh, be happy with having the local knowledge that. She, A can just split it to B and D, but she need not be aware like what B is doing. So A is putting the condition A and B in this contracts with A, B and A, D channels. Now using the condition A, B will form its uh, own con uh, condition with channel uh, B, E. And similarly, D, C forms a new condition, uh, but A needn't be bothered about what condition uh, B and D is designing. So they 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 and they in the locally construct the condition and uh, forward the payment. At the same time, they are forwarding the payment, and this finally reaches the party age. But as you can see, like uh, the again, you we have this problem of um, multiple contracts for a single payment. So in the paper, it was stated that this problem of redundancy needs to be there because if you need the uh, property of unlinkability to hold. And 
we figured out the scheme is still weakly linkable because the public key of the recipient was shared for and uh, uh, secret partial secrets were homomorphically encrypted so it had a bit of high computation overhead and at the same time since the public key of the recipient was being shared so somehow like it could be possible that two payment instances they are using the different public key and even if two parties are colluding and they see they are using the same public key they can figure out with high probability they might be part of the same payment given all these problems of state of the art these are the objectives we which we wanted to uh, realize for our protocol so first is that it should be efficient like as i stated there shouldn't be too time consuming because the basic idea is to make uh, the network scalable so it shouldn't be making the things slow and at the same time should be privacy preserving and atomic like the payment either uh, fully succeeds or it doesn't succeed uh, if even even if one of the partial payment fails and as i previously mentioned that if a uh, no, nodes colluding with each other they can figure out they are part of the same payment they might try to censor uh, such partial payments so we need to ensure that they are unlinkable and uh, there was this problem of constructing multiple off chain contracts in the previous state of the art which i mentioned so what we need is that even if the channel is shared uh, across multiple instances there should be one particular off chain contract on the channel and at the same time one as intermediaries must not be losing coins like when we are designing the protocol how do we realize this uh, uh, thing of uh, avoiding uh, construction of redundant uh, off chain contracts on a uh, shared channel is uh, the basic idea lies in mapping the set of paths to the set of edges once this is done given the set of edges we start with the steps of the protocol so let me talk about how we do this so these are the uh, notations which i have used in my paper and some of them like what are the for the uh, mathematic math maths which we have done like we have taken this elliptic curve of order q and selected a base point so basically basically this uh, security of a protocol comes from the uh, hardness assumption of discrete lock problem so like uh, uh, and also we we have this we have used a standard cryptographic hash function for uh, where we have considered that given the hash it's very difficult to figure out the pre image and also the time out period so depending on what sort of payment channel network you are using so uh, so maybe uh, for each framework like for lnd for eclair for c lightning these terms may be different so i'm not going to like for practical purpose what you can set so in just we have some generic term so let us figure out like how we can map the set of paths to set of edges so we can do a bfs like given the set of we suppose we assume that a already knows like how a this payment has been split and it is reaching h so given the set of path it will ju just do a bfs starting from h so it once it knows that from h you see g and f were involved in routing the payment and again from g e was involved in routing the partial payment and similarly c and e were routing the payments to f and in similar fashion uh, ultimately you go back to a so why i am doing a reverse bfs starting from h i will uh, state it in my next slide so once you are done so what is the what advantage we are get, getting here is that instead of considering each path in, individually we are just uh, mapping it to a set of edges so even if the partial paths are sharing the uh, a particular channel that is getting considered once in the set instead of uh, having multiple entries so like what we did a bfs from h just it uh, allowed us to uh, like uh, de design the time time out period for each of the off chain contracts for uh, like what we need for our protocol because it, uh, else it would be difficult to do that so like uh, since h is the recipient and uh, g and f are the immediate neighbors which is transferring so this gets the least time out period t and next g is getting its flow from e and uh, 
uh, and f is getting its flow from c and e so it is getting a time out period of t plus delta so delta is the time taken for confirming the transaction of chain and next in the next level we have the channels dc and be so we add an extra delta term so it is t plus 2 delta and finally the channels ad and ab so it is having a time of period of t plus 3 delta so this is allowing us to figure out like in a bfs level fashion we can assign the time out period for each of the off chain contracts next let us see how given this set of um, edges uh, how well, like what sort of pre processing can be done so what a does is that a will sample uh, certain secrets for each of these uh, edges involved in routing the payment like for uh, b it will share the secret xbe for the channel be for dc for channel uh, d is having just single channel so xdc the main uh, thing is that e is splitting the payment to g and f so it, it can sample uh, like this uh, secrets for the only the nodes which is routing payment to a single channel but whenever there is a split uh, we in uh, a cannot directly sample that a need to do some back calculation i will come to that like how it will be done and for finally for the recipient h like uh, if it is seeing that it is receiving this partial payments from two such channels so in order to uh, uh, like I'll, uh, in order to see that atomicity holds it will sample two such partial secrets y and y1 and y2 now what h does is that h will uh, sample her own secret xh but she will sh share the uh, she will uh, share as it's a point on the uh, elliptic curve group instead of sharing the discrete law of this so she will just multiply it with the base point g and share it with a so that's what i mentioned like except xeg and xcf like wherever the split of payment is occurring except for that rest of the values are sampled so this particular construction of option contract is inspired from this particular anonymous multi hop lock so what it is being done is that it's the idea comes from that uh, like whatever condition is being shared over here so this can the, the the hardness of this construction comes from the discrete uh, assumption of discrete log hardness so once uh, suppose as you can see p0 is sharing the condition y0 and next p1 uh, has this partial secret y1 so to some extent so the multi hop HTLC was being uh, functioning, uh, was acting, but instead of using hash time lock contract, we are, uh, they have uh, made use of this scriptless script construction. Like uh, basically you can complete the signature only uh, of a particular contract, only if you know these uh, individual secrets. So P1 shares this condition Y1 with its participant and similarly it ends at PN minus one shares the condition YN minus one with PN. So like this particular contract YN minus one can be solved by PN because it has this, got this uh, particular secret key KN, which is summation of all the partial secrets. And once this key is released, uh, y, PN minus one will just subtract YN minus one from KN and reconstruct KN minus one. So KN minus one satisfies the condition YN minus two. And similar way, they just go on, keep on uh, subtracting their partial secrets and ultimately the secret Y0 reaches P0 and uh, the counterparty P1 can claim the payment. So ours is a bit different, like we don't uh, actually go for uh, uh, decrementing of this uh, partial secrets, but rather it's based on incrementing of partial secrets as and when the intermediate parties are claiming their payment. So I will just come back like how the construction is going. So what is the advantage of this particular construction was like it reduced the space for cryptographic operation because, because it, was, it was doing away with hash locks. And uh, it was also improved upon the fungibility because now you cannot distinguish between a regular Bitcoin transaction uh, from this particular transaction for off-chain payments, which had hash locks. Uh, so this is like our condition for off-chain contract. So as I stated, the H is receiving two partial secrets Y1 and Y2. So uh, whatever I have 
I'm stating over here. So all these computations are being done by A. So this is the pre-processing phase. So what uh, A will do, A knows this partial secrets Y1 and Y2. So she will just uh, recombine it and do an addition and blind this particular Y with a blinding factor EGH for this particular channel GH. She will construct the off-chain contract where EGH, EGH you just constructed using hash of this secret Y concatenated with the ch channel identifier. So it is ID of GH. Along with that, it uh, she will, since A has the knowledge of this uh, value, uh, which is shared by uh, your node H, right? So H is not sharing the discrete log, but just the point on the selective curve. So she can, uh, A can just add it up and construct the condition for off-chain contract on GH. And similarly for FH, she can do the similar operation, but this time the channel identifier will be different. So this makes this two con off-chain contracts on channel GH and FH unlinkable. Next, similarly for e EG, EF and CF, so like, oh yes, after GH and FH, you have EG, EF and CF. So what it will do? Uh, she will just uh, add this conditions for this, uh, 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 all the outgoing contracts and add it with the partial secret, which uh, this particular party G had with it itself. So she had XGH and A will use XFH for REF and for CF, she will again use the uh, uh, partial secret XFH because as you know, FH is the outgoing uh, channel for F, but the incoming channels are the ch uh, channels EF and CF. So combine these two flows, uh, it's the outgoing flow for uh, to, uh, to the node H is being constructed. So that's why the dependence on these two incoming flows. Once this is done, so uh, as I had stated previously, like A, A can sample all the partial secrets for each of the node, but instead, uh, but not for the particular node, which is actually splitting the value. So what is the main idea? Like what, what happens if like, if A, 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 C, e, if A is now uh, splitting the flow to G and F, so you can think like we can just uh, add up the uh, conditions used for those outgoing channels like EG and EF and uh, add these secrets and form the condition for this our incoming channel VE. But what can be the problem over here? So now suppose, uh, uh, assume that G has provided the secret to this condition REG and she claims the money coins from E. And suppose for some unfortunate event, a lightning strikes and F is now dead. So F doesn't respond and what happens is that now E cannot uh, solve the CS, uh, condition of put for forth by this channel uh, BE, um, BE, right? Because B, is, uh, B requires the secret from both G and F. So this dependency, if there is a dependency, what happens is now E is paying to G, but E, can, e, e doesn't get the secret from F. And if this is not possible, B, B, she cannot claim coins from B because she can only construct this secret if both the parties are responding. Now she is at a loss because now B, she, B will cancel the contract and uh, B, B is the one ending up losing coins. So this is what we previously mentioned that none of the honest party must lose coins in the process. So what we need to do that we, in order to ensure that we go for some one out of N sharing of secrets and how this is done is that uh, so E now must be allowed to claim coins from B even if one of the neighbor doesn't respond. Uh, so now, sorry, if one of the neighbor responds, so like if e, 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 can, e can be, E will be able to construct the secret which is needed by B, even if G is responding or F responds. Like even if, uh, if one of them doesn't respond, she is not at a loss. So what happens is that to avoid unlinkability, we cannot have uh, used the same condition for these two channels, right? We cannot equate REG with REF. So we have to ensure that these two conditions are different, but we, we have needs a structure, something like this, like RBE must be dependent on REG as well as the secret supplied by uh, this uh, party G that is XEG and REF like the uh, 
channel EF and the condition is supplied by the node F. But the problem is that if you want to do a back calculation, so A should know all the discrete log because only then she can uh, construct the condition, uh, uh, like create a point on this uh, elliptic curve. So what what she knows actually? She uh, if you take a if you do a sub, if you subtract x a g from this R B because as you can see like uh, R B sorry is a combination of R E G and uh, R E F. So uh, over here R E G and R E F is again dependent on R G H and R F H and R G H and R F H is again dependent of E G H Y. So all these values are known. But what she doesn't know is this value X H. But if she takes a, uh, if she just subtracts X H G, so uh, given all these points, she knows uh, she she knows the discrete log value. So now she is all good with the proceeding with the construction. So sorry. Yeah. So what she will do is uh, so she can fix a discrete log for R B minus this point X H G to some random value of her choice. And I'm not going into the details of math, but if you do the back calculation, you can figure out this value X C G and X C F. Uh, given that uh, A now has uh, the knowledge of all the partial secrets. So like previously I stated like uh, that, the, but then it, uh, the structure is a bit different from what I stated here. So it's not exactly REG plus uh, EB of XG, XCG. So we just recombine these two partial secrets and construct the point XC and use it to const uh, like uh, either of these two equations get satisfied then rb rb can be you can get, reconstruct the secret for rb so like even if g or f replies then this uh, uh, like e can claim the coins from b and next the construction for dc ab and ad it's a simple straightforward like whatever we had stated for the rest of the channels because there is no splitting involved but this is the trick for ensuring balance security security of the party which is splitting the payment. So we needed to do this back calculation for reconstruction of secrets. And next, let us see like we a simple uh, onion routing scheme like the one used for HTLC is used for forwarding of contracts. So uh, not onion routing, Sphinx routing uh, protocol which is used in Lightning Network. So as you can see, like uh, the condition RAV plus uh, and the timeout period uh, for each of these off-chain contracts are forwarded. So once these off-chain contracts reaches the designated parties, they get the uh, partial secrets as well. So like D receives XTC and B receives XBE. Similarly, D forwards the off-chain contract to C and B, C receives the partial secret. Next, B forwards the off-chain contract to E and E gets the partial secret. So in similar fashion, everyone forwards the off-chain contract and finally H gets these two partial payments and it will compute that whether she has got all the partial payments. And once all the partial payment reaches her, she will get the partial secrets which she needs in order to reconstruct the uh, secret for claiming the payments from uh, parties G and F because she has her own secret XH but she cannot recompute re the secret needed for solving the contract unless all the partial payment reaches her. So once this is done, so the release phase is like, you just provide the discrete log of each of the condition. So I'm not going into the de details, like just whatever condition I had constructed, uh, I mean, instead, you just provide the secret. So in this similar fashion, the uh, discrete log secrets are provided and finally, uh, A ends up paying the coins to the party H. But now consider that again, uh, what happens like if F is destroyed. So now G is the sole person providing the condition to E. But as I stated that E is now self-sufficient, she can just claim the coins from B. So B uh, provides the secret and uh, also the same property holds here like uh, even uh, a, a can reconstruct back the a, a can provide the money to B. So only the payment succeeds partially, but uh, in the process, like uh, none of the intermediate parties are losing coins, right? Because now your G G was 
uh, G had forwarded to E, but F failed to forward the secret to E. So, but still E was able to claim coins from B. So it's fine, like A is, uh, A is losing coins because A is the ultimate sender. But the rest of the participants, so the correctness holds is like a maximum amount of loss A can uh, make is the total amount she is forwarding, right? So maximum amount of loss is seven units. Rest of the participants, they cannot make a loss. They can either make a profit of zero, that is none of the contracts are succeeding, or the or they make a positive profit like uh, the sum excess over the processing fee they receive. And finally, uh, the participant age, it makes a profit of seven units. So this is how the correctness of the algorithm holds. Next, uh, for the like, these are the privacy and security goals realized by protocol. So as I stated, what is the correctness? I mean, what is the gain each party should have? Uh, consistency is realized like there, there is no one hole attack. Like if, if uh, the outgoing contracts are resolved only then the incoming party can claim money from the incoming uh, contracts. And as I stated previously, like how you can realize balance security. And also there is value privacy because the payments are split and across multiple parts. And there is unlinkability of partial payments because now none of the uh, parties can figure out that whether they are part of the same payment or different instances. And um, also relationship identity anonymity holds because uh, the sender and recipient cannot be identified because this is a problem in HTLC. Like you can uh, consider like if all the parties are going on chain, then with high probability, you can figure out who is transferring the payment to who. But even if all the parties go on chain in this particular protocol, they cannot figure out because the conditions are unlinkable. And of course, atomicity holds like either the payment succeeds fully or it, uh, like either the recipient is receiving the total payment value or it is not receiving. Like oh, the release phase starts only if the recipient is receiving all the partial payments. So th that's a bit difference because as I had shown previously, the S can end up losing the partial of partial amount, but the atomicity over here is like the age must be able to get all the coins which for which the transaction was decided. It shouldn't be that she re he receives the partial amount and starts the release phase. So that's not allowed. So the for security analysis, we have used the universal composability framework. So we have uh, designed an ideal world. Uh, we have taken the ideal world where considering this ideal functionality F, we have assumed the parties are interacting with it. And on top of that, we have constructed an ideal uh, attacker, the simulator, which is basically helps in simulating the pro protocol seen in the real world. But actually, we uh, are not studying the protocol in the real world. We uh, use this ideal functionality for the blockchain and the secure message transmission. Like for each of the channel, we use these uh, two ideal functionalities and we uh, construct this hybrid world for this particular for our protocol. And then we show that the hybrid is indistinguishable from the ideal. And also, like if you just remove this. Uh, uh, blocks of ideal functionality is used and then the hybrid becomes indistinguishable from the real world as well. So we show indistinguishability and uh, for all these previous uh, properties which we have mentioned, we show that these properties hold in the ideal world and with negligible probability we can, for the bad cases, this gets like the, this gets violated and there is a distinguishability attack. So for performance analysis, uh, we have chosen three metrics. So first one is the time taken for executing this protocol. And second is the communication overhead, like how much message is being exchanged for particular for our, this particular protocol. And third is the uh, parameter, which, which is like we stressed in the very beginning is like how much optimization we are achieving in terms of off-chain contracts for such partial payments. So some statistics stats which we provide from the experiments, like when we increase this transaction value to 0 0.04 BTC, so we saw that payment instance uh, like uh, that had multiple routes uh, sharing this uh, payment channels, like there were not edge disjoints. So we saw that such cases shoot up to 
and payment channel shared in a single instance that increased from 33 to around 60% uh, and uh, for each of this particular payment instances, we, uh, we saw that a particular edge got shared from and the, and the number count increased from two to five. So that was quite high, right? If, if we use the state of the art protocol, that means if an edge is shared five times by each of the partial payments, that means you need to construct five such option contracts for a single payment on a single uh, channel. So what is the uh, like, uh, uh, like saving or we can say the saving we achieve in terms of construction of chain contract is that when you increase the payment value so number of off chain contracts con constructed per payment increase from uh, 24 to 68%. So this is the particular saving which we had so uh, uh, of around 69% of saving which uh, we observed uh, like compared to the state of the art. And uh, we also tested it for real instances. So we took a snapshot of Lightning Network. And these are the state of the art. Like we did an extension of multi-hop HTLC, which I stated previously to a multi-path routing protocol. And we compared it with atomic multi-path payment and the splitting payment uh, dynamically. So use, uh, when we observed, we found that CryptoMaze is quite efficient. I mean, almost matching the uh, time, uh, time taken by atomic multipath payment. And, but uh, we saw the overhead is a bit high because we did this uh, since the sender was involved in this pre-processing step and doing this back calculation. And there was some communication overhead because of the, this, this mapping of paths to edges. So we saw that crypto maze is on a bit higher side, but still within feasible bound. But uh, this is uh, fine as long as we are addressing the issues of uh, like the shortcomings of the state of the art. So similar pattern was observed for simulated instance. So we tested up to uh, a network of uh, having 25,000 nodes. And over here, here also we saw that crypto maze is very fast compared to what uh, other uh, multi-path payment protocol where uh, the, uh, uh, the time taken for the other protocols was a bit higher and for multi-hub HTLC it was very high and uh, of course the communication overhead was higher than AMP or the splitting payment dynamically so this is fine like we are addressing as I stated the shortcomings. So like uh, 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 this, uh, uh, the, the best one as we stated was the splitting payment uh, protocol by EK et al. But the problem with this particular protocol is that it was weakly linkable and it was using homomorphic encryption. So we uh, that, that's what we tried to uh, do away with. We didn't want some heavy crypto primitives being used for a pay, for this particular channel payment channel network because that would, uh, be against the very idea of uh, enhancing scalability. So these are some of the open problems. So like, uh, as I stated, like for, we were assuming that the route was, was given to us and then we are designing the payment protocol. So we want to do something like what this uh, paper of dy dynamic splitting of payment is uh, doing. So we want to reduce the computation overhead on the center and make it more efficient. But the challenge is that like, it is very difficult to figure out what is the fee for each, because you do not know which, which parties will be the intermediate parties routing the payment, right? Uh, whenever you are splitting dynamically. So it might be the case that in some intermediate parties in order to earn fees might be routing the payment via longer paths where certain nodes in this path might be uh, an, uh, an, uh, uh, another uh, like, uh, uh, an pre-image of this particular party. So there might be several civil nodes. So deciding the fees, the channel, and then I, as I mentioned that li linkability is an issue. And also there, there was a problem of uh, redundant option contracts. So given all these, uh, can we design a protocol avoiding all these problems? Next is that uh, since we are still using a staggered, staggered lock time for this particular protocol, can we move to a constant collateral locking protocol where you can use constant time update for each of the channels. And as I mentioned that we are leveraging on this 
scriptless script construction which relies on schnorr or ecdsa but this is not supported by all cryptocurrencies so can we make it generic so there is a single path construction provided by tyagrajan and malvolta so based on bls signature scheme so can we do something based uh, based on uh, such a construction so that's all from my side so uh, this work is available in this uh, archive and it's accepted in ieee tdsc and uh, if you have any questions uh, feel free to us uh, i will be happy to take questions now and even if it's not possible now you can reach out to either me or my co-author shushmita uh, so with this i end my presentation all right. Thank you so much for joining us today. I know I really er, enjoyed your presentation. Uh, it's fun seeing a lot of other folks who have taken part in the research seminar series being cited in your work here. And it looks like our lab leads and a few other folks who joined think this topic and what you were discussing is extremely timely for some of the research that we're conducting here at PL and also the space in general. So I want to thank you again for joining us today. Um, for anyone who's watching on YouTube, um, if you would like to join these call or these uh, talks live, feel free to go to our GitHub account that's linked down in the description. And you can also follow us on Twitter at Proto Research to be able to get any new updates about new speakers coming out in the future. And then one final update. Um, if you're interested in applying to one of our grants, for example, the PhD, postdoc, um, or faculty grants, those applications will be due on April 14th, 2022, so in a few weeks. So go and take a look at those at uh, grants.protocol.ai. So Subra, thank you again for joining us today. I really appreciated your talk, and I hope you had a good time, and we look forward to hearing from you again soon, all right? Yeah, and thank you, Trent, and it was a pleasure, and I really enjoyed giving the talk.